Next uh, up is, is Westcard, and Westcard is the CEO of, of Jones Apparel Group, and um, that company, besides all the great products from Jones and Jones Signature and Jones Sport that they, that they make, also um, has other great brands, Nine West being a huge handbag and, and shoe brand, Bandolino, Easy Spirit, Gloria Vanderbilt, and importantly, Rachel Roy, who you're going to meet in just a few more minutes. Uh, Wes became the CEO of, of Jones in 2007. Prior to that, he was the chief operating officer. He was the chief financial officer uh, of that company um, before that and had a lot. He's a CPA. He had lots of financial background and experience uh, uh, previous to that. So he's a great example uh, of what, what Daryl Rigby talked about yesterday of, of a left brain you know, person. Uh, who, who, in his case, has done an amazing job of surrounding himself with a lot of right brain, you know, creative, talented uh, people, and then figuring out how to effectively, you know, manage that relationship for terrific growth. And we have a great relationship, as, as does uh, uh, many companies in this room with the Jones Apparel Group. And so please welcome Wes Card. Uh, and Terry, just want to congratulate you again on, on what you're doing with the university. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. It really is an example to all of us in leadership positions that you really need to go above and beyond and, and, and really work on things outside of just your normal day-to-day -day jobs. And uh, you should be, you've, you've been commended for that. And I appreciate you getting me involved and in, in learning more about the, uh, the program and getting involved with the university as well. Um, what I, as I looked at the agenda and went through the um, various speakers, um, I thought that it'd be interesting to talk about a little bit about today's environment, how we think that is positioned for growth. All of this innovation is great, but it, it needs to lead to an end result, and that is growth that we're all focused on uh, in our companies. Talk about our template for growth in Jones Apparel Group. How do you get a $3.3 billion organization starting to show some sales growth? And then, more importantly, show some selected in initiatives that we're working on that I think a lot of which you've probably covered in the various presentations over the past several days. Uh, items that, specifics that we're working on that show how we're using innovation to stimulate growth and get the top line growing again. Uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, after which you'll meet Rachel Roy. I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about the Rachel Roy brand, how we've been working on growing that brand. One component of it is an exclusive with Macy's. So Terry will be interviewing Rachel, and you'll get uh, you know, a, a really good sense of how designers think and feel, and how that relates back into the business aspects of what we're doing. Uh, today's environment, sure was great to see those comps yesterday. I mean, it was phenomenal. I saw that retail stores uh, had reported, it was the best comp reported in 13 years. Uh, really great results. And when you think about where we were last year, that bottom left circle here, stage one, where people really weren't buying anything unless they really had to buy it. You know, we were really in a uh, necessities, people only buying small tickets. Everything to do with housing had slowed down. We all know what that felt like. Really standing here last year, I don't think we would have had any clue as to how the year was going to turn out. It turned out much better than, than we expected. We're now moving over into stage two, where people are buying more uh, discretionary items. You could see that in the consumer spending results yesterday, both small tickets on the upper left side and the big ticket items starting to move. Pe automobile sales have been pretty brisk. So people are feeling much better, a uh, little bit cautious in their, their purchasing. But you know, I, I think that a lot of it has to do with something that people aren't talking much about. If you go out into a store today, and look around compared to last year. Last year you walk into any department store, specialty store, and you'd see large amounts of 70% off, 60% off product. We had spring products sitting in department stores behind racks of clearing, clearance goods. So you really couldn't see the, the product. Along with that, uh, over the year, we've all been working on focusing assortments, uh, editing out it, editing out brands that weren't working, components of products, working really hard on the merchandise and how it looks in the stores. And now there's very little clearance. So what you see as you look in a department store, you see the goods, it, it's lighter, it's brighter. Everything looks better. The consumer's feeling a little bit better. 
and they've really started to uptick their purchases. I think a lot of it just has to do with the, the lower amount of inventories in the stores. There is very little organic growth, though, now. Uh, and I think that it's all about market share, and we're all competing through innovation and ways to get that customer to react to our products. Uh, I know there's been a lot of talk over the year about this new frugality, that the customer is, is just not going to spend. And remember the stories last year about the shopping bags where people um, were, were taking their Chanel or Prada bags and they were replacing it with, a, with, a, with another bag so people um, wouldn't see that they had bought those products. And there was talk about luxury was dead and uh, you know, all of that, everything goes in extremes, particularly with public companies. We know it's either all or nothing most of the time with the media and the investment community. I think it's some, somewhere in the middle here between frugality and care in the way people purchase. There is a difference in the mindset. It's starting to loosen up now. And I don't think we're ever going to go back to this uh, abandoned purchase of luxury goods. But luxury certainly isn't out. Uh, and I think as we went through the year last year, people would ask me about that. Was luxury dead? And I, I'd say, well, if you've been driving a Mercedes for, uh, say, 20 years, you probably, when, when it comes time to buy a new car, you're, well, you might wait a little bit longer. You might buy a different model. You might look at a Lexus or a BMW, but you're really not going to go buy a Chevrolet or a Kia or something totally out of character with where you've been purchasing. So luxury isn't dead. In fact, $1,000 shoes are selling right now very strongly again uh, in New York and in the major markets. There's a bag of one of the, uh, I think it's a Chanel bag, that's out of stock everywhere in New York. Uh, where last year there were, you know, hundreds of bags uh, marked down throughout the city. So luxury is not gone. It's going to slowly come back. And I think we're going to stay right back. The consumer is going to stay balanced between being a little more careful about their purchases and also uh, continuing to buy things that they really want and value. Uh, and this, this, this chart you really can't see. But I think as we think about uh, brands, People are focused on value and values. Uh, they want brands that they can trust, brands that they can rely on, uh, p companies that are uh, concerned with corporate social responsibility. You saw that flavored throughout the presentations this morning and yesterday. Uh, people look to, to, for stories, how they relate brands to their own lives. And so I think all, we're focused on that as we look to gain market share against today's consumer. So that's sort of the general feeling. I think the climate is right now for growth, and we're seeing that in the comp store sales. We're at a point in our history where we need to start to show top line sales as well. Our sales have contracted as, as inventory purchases have gone down and business slowed down. Our sales went down considerably last year. But I feel like we're at a point, and I've told our investors, that we, our, our core brands have stabilized. And I'll, I'll show you what, what those brands are. So if you have a stable core with new innovation, uh, we can grow around that. But investors reward size. There's no question why there's so much focus on, on uh, growth. There, I saw a study several years ago that stock valuations, price, earnings ratio, price to earnings ratios, can be correlated almost directly to the size of companies. Now, the bigger the company, the better chance you have for a higher valuation. It just is statistically valid. That's why Procter & Gamble, a company, large consumer product companies have such strong multiples. So people like size, and as Wes McDonald mentioned this morning, consistent growth. Um, I wrote on here, no growth is not an option. I, I'm not sure if that's grammatically correct. I've been thinking about that. It's been, I know, I know that means just the opposite of what it says, but I think you probably all get it. You either grow or you die. Uh, as brands get stale, there's only one place to go, and that's backwards. And that's why investors, if you think about what happened last year with, with the stock market, basically they thought sales are collapsing, the consumer has stopped, industry is going to go out of business, and stocks were priced as if we were all going out of business. It was absolutely ridiculous. But it was so focused on the sales trends. Uh, how many times do companies announce earnings were up 15%, Sales were up 15%, but we think next quarter sales might be only up 2%. Boom, the stocks go down. It's just this, and, but investors are focused on it for a reason. 
And I think Wes McDonald also mentioned, if your sales don't grow at some point, you can only take so much out of costs and expenses and efficiencies. There's only so much you can do to generate uh, operating earnings growth. So you need to grow the top line. Uh, and I can tell you, my board is absolutely insistent that we start, start growing the company. It's, it's a major goal that they've laid out for me and something that we're focused on. So how do we, how do we grow uh, at our size? And then we'll transition into some specifics on this. The first thing on the left here, we need to make sure the flagship brands, the big parts of our business, the core, uh, as Daryl Rigby has uh, uh, taught me so frequently from Bain, you've got to f concentrate on that core, make sure it's steady, and hopefully innovate and reinvent brands that have been around for a long time. Nine West is the number one shoe brand in America by far in terms of closet share. It's a 65 countries worldwide, uh, over a billion dollars in sales. It's 40 years old. Uh, Jones New York is 40 years old very large brands. So we, you have to constantly evolve and invigorate those brands. So that's the left side is getting the core growing, uh, which you need to do in a large company. And then the new ideas that you put in place can start to add to growth on top of that. And that's where innovation comes in, launching new brands and new businesses. Uh, as we looked at our portfolio and strategy, there's books and books written about strategy, and you can make it really complicated. Sometimes it can be very simple. You look at this triangle, even from the back you can see we've got a lot of big bubbles in the middle and towards the right side. The right side is classic. Traditional clothing, tr classic shoes, easy spirit, a, a shoe for the baby boomer, a very, um, an older customer, very traditional shoe. Uh, we don't have much, we didn't have anything at the top, and this goes back a couple of years when I took the job. Very little at the top, which is the high, the higher end, we have more of the contemporary products and the luxury part of the business. And then down the left side, which is all contemporary, we had very little of those businesses in our portfolio. So our goal is make the big bubbles bigger, Jones New York, Nine West, Easy Spirit, so that you have a good steady core, and then bring new things in around that and target the other parts of the business. So I'd like to just now go through several examples of different ways that we think of to do that, uh, which I think will give you a, a little more practical sense of, of application of, of, what, of, of innovation. So meet Rachel Roy, and you will, you will meet her uh, shortly. Um, we, uh, knowing that we didn't have any contemporary business at all, and also knowing that Macy's and Bloomingdale's and all Nordstrom, everybody was shifting towards the, the contemporary customer. All the hot brands were contemporary brands. <coughs> Tory Burch, uh, you, you name them, they were all um, in, the, in the younger, contemporary, different fit, different look. We had ver very little of that in our portfolio. We looked in, in the uh, uh, people out there doing business and we spotted Rachel, young American designer in the contemporary zone, and we just went and sat with her. Now we didn't have this chart, Rachel's a designer, we didn't sit down with a book or a chart, we just sat down at a table. Uh, and we said, Rachel, you know, what, what do you want to do? What, what do you want to be when you grow up? What, where do you want your business to be? So we really looked at the raw material uh, and said, is this somebody that wants to develop a bigger business, a broader business? Rachel made it very clear she wanted to bring her business and her aesthetic from the high end. She's dressing um, and we're selling $2,000 dresses. The first lady has worn her clothing many times. Uh, but we're selling at the very high end. But she wanted to bring the clothes to a much broader audience, whether it be uh, a Macy's or Penny's or whatever. We hadn't really decided on that. That became very clear. Um, so we, we looked at her as what her aspirations were. How did she fit culturally with us? Uh, and then evaluated across all the other aspects on this chart and said, we have a business here. We think we have willing customers. Uh, let's take a shot at it. So Rachel will talk about why Rachel a little bit, you know, what her product aesthetic is. Um, she is multicultural, and, and we talked to you, diversity is another topic that popped up over and over in the presentations this morning. It's very important that you just don't go to a, uh, a very narrow targeted uh, audience. Uh, she's become a tastemaker, an influencer, 
uh, and she'll tell you her story when she comes out. Then we went to Macy's and said to uh, Terry and his team, you're focused on contemporary. You'd like to have exclusive brands. That seems to work very well. Uh, we have a great designer here. We want to design a line. Would, if we designed the right product to fill, fill this void that you have in your stores and trying to draw the younger customer in, would we, would we have a business? So Terry said, being a good retailer, sounds great, but show me the product. Uh, so we had to develop the product to go with that. Now, when you think of innovation, it sounds like, okay, just you know, give it to the teams, the design teams, and develop the product. But think about our triangle. Everything was on the right side of that triangle. We needed a whole new team. That's a different product. And you'll actually see the, uh, some of the young ladies on that team as, as we go through the, uh, the presentation. We hired a team, showed that Macy's the product, and Macy's responded. Now, we picked Macy's. Primarily the national clout, Rachel will be on the uh, spring ads on TV nationally this, this coming uh, season. Um, you know, Macy's was going after that contemporary customer, had done some very successful launches. Tommy Hilfiger was uh, relaunched on that floor uh, and really starting to build that business. Um, and you know, one, one thing about Macy's that, and I've mentioned to Terry a couple times, they can take a national, a national event becomes equated with Macy's. So think of the Thanksgiving Day Parade. That is Macy's. Um, think of the Indianapolis 500. Last year, uh, went down, we actually had a meeting in Herald Square the uh, day before that uh, was, uh, uh, or the, the week before the actual race, and the whole store was Indianapolis 500. All the stores around the country were Indianapolis 500. So Macy's with 800 doors can take a, a national event and drive that business down through the stores, and then if you combine that with My Macy's, and you tailor what you're doing in each store against that national event, think of the power of that. So we thought, this is where we need to be with this product line. Uh, we've also had a great collaborative relationship with Macy's, so it, that's how we got started in launching this diffusion line, uh, which Terry has said is one of the uh, most successful, if not the most successful, contemporary line they've introduced in the store. Now, telling her story, I think it's maybe more interesting for all of you because this is where all the social media and the way this younger customer thinks and how you have to uh, market the brand. And it's a whole variety of activities. Very little is national advertising, fashion magazine, um, except for the Macy's TV and collaborative work. It's very little of that. It's all granular. And as we've done that, Rachel Starr has continued to rise. I mentioned, uh, uh, we don't have any shots in here, but uh, Michelle Obama's worn a number of her clothes, and, and then many celebrities and others have worn the, uh, the clothes. We started last August. The first thing we did, Vogue TV. Vogue TV did a three-part uh, documentary on Rachel. Uh, they uh, talked talk to her about you know, how she got into the business. It was, it was her history, basically. At VogueTV.com, I should say. So this got all over the internet, lots of attention. It was launched right about the time we launched the product into Macy's. Next, uh, yeah, this was put out on iPhone, and I, I, I think I'd be, rem I gotta tell you my favorite iPhone story, because uh, when, when you want, want to think about where the iPhone is gonna lead this world uh, in that technology, I was sitting in my office uh, one day, my phone rang, and cell phone rang, I picked it up, I looked, my daughter-in-law was calling me. So I picked it up and said, hello, hello. And I heard a lot of noise, but didn't hear anything. Hello, and I hear this little voice pop up, dad, dad? I'm like, well, it was my grandson, Henry, who was 10 months old, can't talk. Now he's got on the phone, uh, Hen is this Henry? And he said, <laughs> That's how he says yes. He just grunts. He, can't, he literally cannot communicate yet. So he grunted. He said, Fafa? And I said, yes. This, he calls me Fafa. This is Fafa. And great. And I said, well, is mommy there? <laughs> uh, and I could hear her in the background talking to her friends. Now, my daughter has no idea. Ten-month-old that cannot communicate at all, picks up an iPhone, dials, is communicating with me in New York, so I said, okay, does Fafa love Henry? He said, ugh. I said, okay, well, goodbye. I'll talk to you later. So I filled my granddaughter in. Now, you think of that mind, 
and a 10 month old, the way that mind starts to evolve. And they're now gonna be able to connect to all these applications. They sit and play, they're, my grandchildren's favorite toys are their parents' iPhones. And they play all the games. He can play tic-tac-toe. He can't say yes yet, but he can play tic-tac-toe. That gives you an idea of the, the sense of, in, in all of the discussion we're having about this. Uh, this is leading us down. This was my revelation of, uh, of the iPhone. We did a pop-up store last summer. We did it, we opened two days before the launch in Macy's, down in Soho. Uh, plenty of real estate available last year. They're filling up now, by the way. It is starting to look a little bit better, but we had a great location. We built a store. Uh, Jim Cramer actually came down and did a show down there with me in the pop-up store because he wanted to learn more about what was going on in pop-up stores. Uh, the, uh, we, we launched the product, we co-branded it with Macy's. We said this will be open for a few weeks and then we'll open up in Macy's um, right after that. Uh, we, had a, we actually had the, the launch party at Macy's and uh, here was done on a, a night, it's a, a fashions night out in New York City. It was a fantastic night uh, all over the city. It felt like Halloween because there were so many people out in the street shopping, we had a party at this store. Uh, we had Estelle there, Grammy Award winner Estelle, um, who was one of Rachel's friends. I'm not sure if you've heard of Lady Bunny, but she was there. Uh, Google her and you'll, enough said. Um, <laughs> you know, but we had a wonderful party there. It was, it was uh, uh, a great evening, and it was concurrent with the launch up at Macy's. So it just got a lot of excitement going on the brand. When they were unpacking the boxes in Macy's at Herald Square, because of all this social marketing, people were buying the product out of the boxes before we even got it on the racks because the people were, they, we, there were comments on the blogs, I'll go to Macy's and buy that product. I'm, that will get me into Macy's to look at this product. Um, then we started to collaborate, bring other, uh, more of a story to Rachel than just Rachel. Estelle uh, has designed a um, uh, line of jewelry with Rachel that's going to be uh, marketed, as you can see, announced on Twitter. The, all the social marketing, you need content. We constantly need content on our internet sites. So we've been now videotaping just about everything we do uh, to provide that, because it's hard to. Uh, someone uh, asked this morning, how do you keep things fresh? And it's difficult to keep innovating. Um, in fall, we'll be doing a collaboration with Jessica Stam, uh, also uh, connected to the Rachel line. So connecting her to other fashion authorities uh, as a way to continue to uh, market the brand and get out uh, into the blogs. Uh, you really have to amplify the buzz here with bloggers. You know, we, we had a, a blog, a, a, f a fashion editorial party before we launched the line. We had 50 or 60 people uh, in a room, all bloggers and, and writers, editors, uh, and you know that, that's how you get mentioned in all of these different editorial avenues that uh, this young customer is shopping in. Uh, we, um, same thing with, uh, uh, with different bloggers here. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, tie in with a, a surfing champion, Karina Petroni, for next spring. She's the number one women surfer in the country. We're gonna do an athletic casual shoe line with her, connected to the Rachel line. So all of these uh, ways of connecting, this feeds out into the fashion community and keeps the buzz going about the brand. And then storied packages and, and, and product imaging. Uh, we're, we're tied into uh, recycling, the recycled hang tag. Uh, Rachel is teaming up with Fairwinds in Africa, which is a project that Terry's been involved with, with Macy's, uh, employing Rwandan women who weave baskets uh, and we're actually literally feeding people through this, through this work and providing jobs that just are, don't exist. Uh, major collaboration, she, they did uh, woven uh, handbags for the Rachel collection for last fall, so we're working on that. Estelle has unique packaging. Um, use, use of artists. The creative director's husband, the, the woman that works for Rachel, that, that designs a lot of this product in concert with her, is an artist. So we're using him to uh, design fabrics for dresses. The, uh, they're connected to um, <coughs> Peace Train, was another artist, art, artistic venture where 
We had an artist design a handbag. Uh, the use of graffiti. Uh, we are connected to a graffiti artist who was you know, designed graffiti handbags and dresses in the initial launch. Was at the launch party. Everybody got to sign the sign the uh, graffiti that was on the wall, uh, and just lots of fun things that tie into telling a story and creating the buzz. Brand. So now the triangle. Uh, you get a few new blips on here, little blue blips. The luxury part of the business for Rachel up in the top, and then down right in the center, the launch with Macy's that has lots of promise uh, and lots of legs to it as we work through that with Macy's. So that was where we, we collaborated and worked with a brand new concept, created it, brought it from its infancy right through to success in the stores, and hopefully will be a, a additional growth for us in the future. Uh, the second one is a little bit clear, it's just acquisition. Uh, we, we had learned of a company, Robert Rodriguez, doing less than 20 million in sales. This company is, sells in 650 of the world's finest doors, Bergdorf Goodman, Sachs, Neiman's, Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom, Lane Crawford in Hong Kong, Harrods in the UK, Holt Renfro in Canada, all the finest doors, 600 doors, doing less than 20 million this much product depth. Very limited selections because they would not take, couldn't take risks as a private company. And again, it's, I think a, a good uh, point about acquisitions to think about, there's been books, books and books written about acquisitions. I think the most important thing that never gets written down in a book is, how do you, what's, your, what's the relationship going to be like with the key people? When we met Robert and his partner, Nicola, who have created this business, it's a phenomenal brand. We sat down with the investment bankers, and the bankers came out with a stack of books this high. And uh, I said, no, put the, put the books away. Just forget the books. And they were shocked, because uh, well, the bankers had spent all night working on this stuff. And you know, I just said, no, forget that. Let's just talk about the business. What do you want to accomplish, Robert? What do you want to accomplish, Nicola? What, tell us about the product. How do you, we had a great discussion. And that first meeting cemented the relationship. They did not want to sell a business to anybody but us because of the relationship, the feeling that we had. And this is a business that has substantial legs for growth uh, and uh, something that we're going to really nurture. And they were only doing apparel at this point. And Robert uh, can design shoes and handbags, men's. It's tremendous potential with this brand. We're very excited about it. And we go through, I, we show this slide, you can't read it obviously, but as we edit out acquisition candidates, you know, we look at what, <clears throat> what the brand positioning is, what are the uh, categories that we could add to the brands that don't exist, such as footwear, uh, price points, competition. You know, you go through a whole selection process because it's very important when you have lots of opportunities for, for growth to really edit down and be very careful and selective. If you, you can make little mistakes, can be uh, very costly. So now with, with Robert Rodriguez, we filled in now a couple of other blips towards the top of that triangle. And I think and those those little dots, pink dots, can get much bigger over time. Now we we talk a little bit about the core brands: Jones New York, very large brand, backbone brand of department stores, sells to the baby boom customer. Um, we had one of our designers that said, you know, we're really missing the way I dress on the weekend, which is a much more relaxed, comfortable kind of clothes for the baby boomer. Um, sort of like Eileen Fisher, but more at a, at a higher price point. This came in at a better price point. We saw a real niche here. Um, just launched in 300 doors. It's somewhat unique, uh, flip back. Typically, when you, you put the apparel in the apparel department, the department stores won't let you put the jewelry with it. If you take the jewelry off this outfits, what do they look like? It's too plain. It just doesn't have the zing. So we got the, our store customers to allow us to sell the merchandise right in the uh, department where the clothes are sold. And we had a really outstanding launch of this product. We're, we're uh, blowing the plans away in the first couple of months of, of sales. It's a way to intensify on Jones New York and keep Jones New York modern. It's not for the younger customer. We recognize that. But there's a huge baby boomer population. But they want modern, relevant clothes. So this was a way to 
uh, intensify on that, on that big bubble at Jones, New York, and there are other things that we're doing around it to also uh, modernize and keep that brand relevant for today's consumer. Similar thing with Nine West. Nine West Shoes, as I mentioned, 40 years old. Nine West has been a dress shoe, uh, dress boot and boot, uh, and sandal resource. We never had a casual business. So the marketing department and the, the designers uh, decided Instead of just adding casual shoes, let's add a category, let's add a label called Nine West Vintage America. Capitalize on this, this uh, trend towards vintage clothing. Uh, so we marketed this as a separate entity, launched it last fall, and we, we, we were actually a little bit lucky. We, we launched it right into a very strong boot season. So you have really well-designed, well-priced vintage look boots, which is you know, the worn, a timeless kind of uh, look and had an outstanding launch and now going into spring and this year it's another way to first broaden Nine West into a category it wasn't in casual as well as uh, just um, add to the business in, in that category. This young, younger customer obviously again ties into social media and internet based so how do you reach that consumer through all of this, this social contacts? We decided to have a contest for um, the uh, next, the voice of Nine West Vintage America. Went out on the, on the web, invited people to participate in a contest. The winner, who you'll see in a minute, will record a record for Sony Records. We got thousands of responses. And this, again, provides editorial content, gets out to bloggers, which creates several million touch points, and really, um, uh, helps to invigorate the whole launch of this brand and get it started. So tying into that talent is just amazing. Uh, we got so many responses that were just so uh, as good as that, uh, and you know we're really helping to get this brand launched in a whole different way uh, than what we had done. And this connection to music, you notice in a number of these different initiatives, is so important for the younger customer. Um, we're going to connect with Josh Stone in fall of 2010, fall of this year, for another collaboration uh, tying into music, a performance of Fashion's Night Out, all ways to stimulate and keep a 40-year-old brand relevant. So Nine West, which is, base, is our largest brand, uh, we're a number of new initiatives to, to keep that moving forward. And then finally, just a, a different kind of example, where we, ha we have a brand that's stalled in its current environment, we had a brand named uh, <coughs> LEI, stands for Life, Energy, and Intelligence, a, a junior jeans brand that was kind of stalled out in the uh, lower end department store businesses. We were doing about $65 million. We went to Walmart, and uh, the reason we went to Walmart, just through their traffic numbers alone, uh, the number one junior uh, shopping location, uh, just the traffic that rolls through Walmart, uh, we went to Walmart with this brand and in the first year out did over $250 million, a brand that had stalled. And again, growth is critical to a brand because once they stall, they just start to go down. Uh, and what we picked up was the, uh, uh, we provided phenomenal product at $18 a jean. Uh, great product, advanced washes and design. Uh, and we, we, we gave that to the Walmart customer tied in with, we got a little bit lucky again here, we tied in with Taylor Swift the month before she was uh, the new, the, the best new female vocalist at the Country Music Awards, and of course her star just uh, uh, really climbed dramatically after that. Um, it, you know, she was tied, we tied into the tour, uh, we, she had a denim covered guitar that we made, it was just, it was phenomenal, and it created a lot of uh, terrific uh, selling around that brand. She's going on to other things. So how do you, we talked about just uh, hiring another celebrity endorser or picking somebody else to take her spot. And we thought, okay, same concept as the other innovation. Uh, let's go out to the public and ask for, uh, we have a contest for who wants to be the next model citizen, the next spokesperson for LEI and take Taylor's place. Walmart loved the idea. It was a whole different way of marketing for them. Uh, and we're dealing with this young woman who lives on her cell phone, so it was the, it was the perfect thing. Uh, 
we, we haven't picked the winner yet. Uh, this was the, the contest that went out on the web. Lots of initial response. I'm going to show you just one clip again, and I think it's the last clip before I introduce Rachel. So I know you've, you've seen enough clips probably to last a lifetime here in the last uh, couple of days. Um, these are the judges. Rachel's going to be a judge. Uh, we're connecting to a charity, Fashion Delivers. We've got some fashion, some models and other muses here to judge the contest and there's prizes and awards. But you watch some of the, the stats here. It's not just about the music, her grade point average, uh, her helping the homeless, things that she wants to do. It just amazes me that you, you go out with these contests and the quality of what you get back is phenomenal. And then using that to market and, and promote a brand uh, is really, I think, where uh, successful companies are going to be, especially when you're, you're reaching this younger customer. Too bad that that sound got uh, clipped up. But she talks about her, her GPA, has done two charity benefits, has sung for kids at the Shriners Hospital. You know, it's just uh, uh, really gratifying when you see things like this coming back. The silence is deafening, isn't it? <laughs> I could sing. I might give it a shot, but I think I'll, I'll hold off on that. But the, the whole concept of a model citizen campaign involves you know, a lot of, of uh, not just the, the product aspects of it, but all of the community involvement and, and, and emphasis on grades. Um, so that's uh, LEI. You can see now the chart. We move down to the bottom of the chart, into the mass markets. Lots of new ideas popping in here. Um, and I'm going to get right to the conclusion. Um, the key on the, to all of this is you need to modernize and keep refreshed the big core brands. You've got to keep them going forward. And even though you can't get big growth out of those brands, it provides a good steady base. And then all of the new innovations and little bits of 1% uh, you know, growth is $30 million. That gives us, you know, $30 million of sales and one of these innovations gives us 1% organic growth, which is really what you need. And then building in things around it uh, to amplify that is how we are striving to grow our company as we uh, uh, go forward.